Um, I would like to ask Harry Becker to tell us about his life. Life? <laughs> life? <laughs> Hi. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Many of you I've seen before and met in competition. Um, I'd like to flesh out a few things that have been outlined here because they've covered all, on a broad scope many of the things that uh, people growing up would experience if they had started at a certain point. And most of us did start pretty young. At 13, I was in the eighth grade, and I was thinking about, I uh, had paper out as usual, everybody had one of those things. And uh, things were tough. Uh, there wasn't much money. You depended on your uh, parents, if you had uh, parents at that time that were going and strong, uh, to depend, maybe perhaps start you in one way or another. Or you depended on a bicycle dealer. Like in San Diego, we had one, Bob Zamalt Sr. And you might have remembered Bob Zamalt. Uh, a gentleman that would sell you a bicycle, and you could pay 50 cents a month. But there was 25 cents of that 50 cents where it went to interest. Any 50 cents you put down, 25% was kept as his interest. So when you'd paid the whole bicycle down, whether you put $10 down or $100 down or whatever, when you got down to the last 50 cents, it was still 25 cents interest. He never got out of it. He was a great gentleman, and uh, his son became a uh, junior champion and a senior uh, rider as well. The, um, to flesh this out just a little bit for you, uh, what would a 13-year-old in the eighth grade be thinking about as he's introduced or sees a bicycle race or so? Okay, I'm down in Balboa Stadium watching Billy Vukovic drive around that track, that crazy quarter-mile uh, heavy mudded clay track, and in the intermission, they had a bicycle race. And they had about 12 guys, and they were the remnants of the 30s and 40s Vets had returned, riding in Balboa Stadium, trying to get around this track that was like uh, slug mud. And wood rims, fixed gears, inch pitch, whipperman chains. Uh, most of them had only a solid, not a solid, actually it was a vulcanized rubber tire uh, by U.S. rubber, and you glued it on with this black goo. Some, that was even before the uh, tape and all the other things. Yeah, there you got it. And uh, they were dead, just dead tires. But you watch these people ride, you thought, damn, that's kind of interesting. And then shortly thereafter, they, they, they went to the last, we had a little eighth of a mile track uh, behind the tennis courts in San Diego. And we'd go to the bicycle shop and hear about some of the other great racers. And then we said, go, make sure you go see the races this Sunday. So you go down there and watch the races, and it was, the week before, the city cut the track in half. I mean, they cut the top half of the track off, pushed it off the side, and made everybody ride on the lower uh, one-third. Naturally crashes, and you can imagine how disastrous that whole thing was. Um, <clears throat> the consequences wa were that you now had an option. Do you do this activity? Because you could go visit the gentleman who is now ailing in Chicago. Frank Greco made most of the Paramounts during the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, ailing in Chicago with uh, inability to walk now. And he was so messed up after falling on this gravelly asphalt that that was the end of his career, basically speaking. So what I want to point out here is that you could start this activity, but you didn't necessarily last very long. You might have lasted two years, three years, but you left the sport after some point. You either had to go to work, you had to go to school. You had to get a job. You had to do something. You couldn't just ride. There was no professionalism. There was no um, incentive. There wasn't any support system for you, basically speaking, unless you knew somebody that had deep pockets, this is the current term, uh, that could promote you in some way. So you basically went to the clubs. Out of the clubs came the camaraderie, the spirit to go to the races. You had 10 races a year, maybe. If you were in Southern California, you might have had 10. Our club could put on maybe one up to two races because it was the money you could raise. The LA clubs, which were a lot bigger, and in up here in Northern California, they could maybe sometimes ride uh, a few more races if the clubs could afford them. But by and large, you just had to travel to these races. Now in California, to come up here, it's 500 miles. To LA, it was 120 miles. But it was 120 miles on a four lane road on 101. And if you can imagine what that was, you couldn't, it would take you 10 hours to do that right now. So. You had to travel to the races. You had to go to where the clubs were putting them on. 
So it became a matter of, well, where are the big specialty races? Well, you had your state championships, both northern and southern. You had some of the memorial races. They had a lot of memorials after the Second World War. There'd be the Walker Memorial, there was a Furman Kugler Memorial in Somerville. There were the large races where states would hold something in commemoration of the athletes that died in the Second World War or were uh, still maimed and injured. The word out of the bicycle shops, well, well where's Martin Darris? Martin Darris was a 39 national champion, but Martin Darris was seriously hurt in the Second World War. He was not able to continue. And we had some vets come back, such as Bob Bergen, who's still racing right this minute, still riding his bike. He just finished the senior nationals up in St. George. Uh, Bob would uh, not really participate with us because we were all 14, 15, 16 years old. What did he want to do with a bunch of 16-year-olds? If you're 30 years old and you're riding around with a 16-year-old, you got a problem real quick because you got nothing to talk about. Ask John Butterfly. Uh, <coughs> so the, the consequences were your field of vision was somewhat uh, co-opted by the larger events. So you prepared for, in your training and riding the races, and you had to ride every race. You had to ride a road race. You had to ride a track, a straight line race. And I should deviate for just a second. There were no road bikes at this point. There were just, in 1952, they come into the country a little bit. Uh, Tetzloff had the whole corner of the market in LA. Uh, I'm just kidding, Bob. Because uh, he had a road bike all the time. The rest of us all had track bikes. <laughs> yeah, he spun them around as he went up the hill. So he spun them around, changed them. So what we had was a, a conglomeration of equipment, um, idiocy of training, nobody to help us. We didn't know anything. So we just went out riding as a group of kids, and we got better, yes. We got faster. Uh, we found that the fastest course was in Southern California around the Rose Bowl, and what a fasty that was. You could really get some speed, and you could power down that thing. But it was always the question of how much speed could you get. Well, when we couldn't beat Jack Disney, we had to race downhill and sprint. The faster we went downhill, the faster we could go. So that was one of the techniques of beating Disney. And we had many races. And I spoke to Jack on, on Wednesday, and uh, he's quite a character. Um, so the racing varied between a straight line road. You had a multiple series of sprints. Or you occasionally went to a, a venue that had a, a circular course. So it was a criterion-like course where they rode around and around, and there was a sprint every time. And those were at Paramount, some of, some of the others. And this is all Southern California. Uh, at Berkeley, 52 to 56, I rode a lot of races up here in Northern California, but didn't have much time to ride, but rode many races on the uh, uh, non-defunct, the, the defunct, I didn't ride the races on it. We had, we had to ride on the, uh, the, fair, the grounds up at the uh, San Francisco. There were three, three, two or three races there, but most of them were held at uh, the, uh, not Bergina, the uh, San Jose facility, the auto track. So that became a new venue to see if you could ride these low banking or very low banking tracks. As the uh, nationals were, had a problem all the time. They were trying to reciprocate between <coughs> the east having it one, then the Midwest and the west, and then back and forth pattern them back and forth. And so what kind of courses could they put up? And so the courses became a big question in your preparation and training. There were no road races. It was just like I said. Seniors, one, two, five, ten. Juniors, three races. One, two, five. Five was the best up to that point. So when the 49 Nationals come out here to San Diego, um, it is going to be on Balboa Stadium on the track. So they let the thing dry, put a little more dirt up on it, and around they go. And most of you have seen the iconic photo of Bob Trevini on his face in the South Turn. And it was a miraculous photo taken by Bob Hirsch. And he submitted it to Life Magazine. And Life Magazine refused to accept it as the best picture of the week. You know, they had a picture of the week. You probably remember that. No, 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 you had it. Life Magazine? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, the, guy, the guy that won it was the fellow that fell, went straight off his motorcycle into the wall and got killed. So he got the. No, he got the photo. Uh, that led to uh, much of us, uh, uh, many of us training for the, well, the club. We had prepared for 49 and 50. We marched on to 50 in New Brunswick, New Jersey, 
and uh, were successful as juniors. We return uh, to San Diego and we are looking at the future now. Once you've got out of the juniors, which is one thing, as Bob will test, uh, and Jack and all the others that have ridden these things, the seniors were a, a formidable group. This was a formidable group. You had to know how to han handle your bike and you had to know the way to fight your way through to the front. If you were going to go to the front or you were going to go from behind, you had to, it had to be perfect, had to be timed just right. So entering in uh, your, as a junior, you're automatically qualified, if you won the juniors, you were automatically qualified to ride the 51 nationals. So in the 51 period, um, Gus Gatto is going to win this thing, as mentioned. And uh, on down the line, accordingly, how you, you finished. And uh, Ernie was there. And uh, <laughs> we're born in the same period, weren't we? Yeah, we were 34. Anyway, uh, y so then you move on to that, and you maybe were requested to take a look at international racing. But obviously, you had to go to school, so you said, no, can't do that. So the following year in um, 19. Uh, 52 was going to become an Olympic trials. Okay, you had your national championships and you had your district championships. The hottest thing and the hardest racing was always the district. The nationals were, yeah, you might win, you might, you might get in there. At, uh, you just had to have the right venue, the right track. In 1952, uh, oh, pardon me, let's go back to that. Uh, 51, we went around a, around a uh, park course, round and round and round this course, and it was in St. Louis. And you, you kept thinking, well, it only has a less than a half a block when you turn the last corner to the sprint. And it, it just made for, if, unless you were in the right position, broke away way back two miles and were in the lead going into the last turn, that was the only chance you had. And, but Gus pulled it off. 52, uh, we went to the Olympic trials. And the Olympic trials are then put in, pr in front of the nationals. You could ride the states, that would qualify you, but you were, the national championships were then behind the Olympic trials. And the Olympics were settled, so then they brought the Olympians back, let them all ride. They didn't have to qualify, they just all got to ride, theoretically. And so then a national champion, you saw Steve Romjack there in 52, he didn't have to qualify, he just was automatically the Olympic representative, he, he gets on the team. So a lot of questions were being asked by a lot of the club members, well, how do you get on this team? Well, you can go back and compete. You can go back and uh, politicize because 48 was quite controversial. 48 saw a selection of men that were placed by individuals. They didn't compete. They were just placed there. And we pretty much all know that. I don't know, if you have questions, we can take that up later. But um, then uh, what 48 revealed when you were a young kid, Ted Smith was the, the key guy. Jack Hyde was the best guy. Spring, second, a third in the world. Fantastic racer. Uh, we had Berlando. We had uh, Ed Lynch, the 48 team, here in, San, here in L.A. Seriously burned in 50, and he's lucky to be alive. He lived a number of years and then has now since passed. But a great guy and a great writer, a real reformist in this activity. You'd see these men, and they would be there at a time, and then they're gone. And my question came uh, to me, I was talking to Ted Kirkbride about this, how was it that there was such a short term for some people? Others of us went on and riding, were still riding. But the point was it isn't competition, it was the need for work. You had a service, rep you had to be in the service two years if you graduated in this period of time. You had the Korean War, they were sucking you up. As mentioned, you go to the service, you, you might get special service. Well, I was in the service, you got nothing. Nothing. That's not a look. You just lost. If your draft didn't suck you into special services, you didn't get to prepare. So by the time we get to the 60 Olympic trials, the Army team, as mentioned here, the Army team has been training on the course, which is one of the worst on record ever. Which brings you now to the final summation of uh, a racer in this period. You could ride these races. You could win these races. You can get a third, a second, and you might be not making it to the top because in 54, if you take down the whole field in the first race and you're injured, you're not going to win the race because half the field didn't have to ride that race. They wouldn't ride the race. It was so bad. That raises a very, very important point. 
I think, of paramount importance. The most, one of the most significant writers in this period was Jack Disney. And Jack made a very critical decision. You rarely saw him in Olympic performances in the 50s because each time he saw a venue that was so bad that he would not be willing to risk it, he didn't race. Yet he had all the power and speed and everything else. Very, very difficult man to beat. The rest of us were idiots. We rode and rode and rode. We crashed. We did everything that was possible to try to win. We accepted the course as given. Again, this is that conformity. But it is also the beginning of a rebellion that led us in time to begin to ask for more decent courses. So in 54, when you take down the front of the field and they all crash, Charlie Hewitt seriously injured uh, in the groin, running into the stands, uh, just bad courses. On a quarter mile running track off camera, you cannot hold the nationals on that kind of, that was absolutely insane. And the moment the first race was over, they stopped all the races and said, no, we'll go out on the streets. And so they went out on the streets, Jack Disney won. Because he could, he could really fuel it. Uh, the next move, you begin to move to the Pan Am Games. We're in 1955. And uh, interesting thing about that, uh, uh, this is one of the great races that I hope somebody will interview Jack Disney because he put out an effort at the Pan Am Games that nobody really knows much about. Um, there was a team, two people, Carl Wetberg, Al Stiller from Chicago, Michigan area. Uh, they were already there. They didn't made no attempt to try and qualify for that team other than say that we're here, we'll ride. And the U.S. was more than happy to do that. Jack Disney and myself were at the, uh, the other part of the team. You're left with no money. They gave you enough of a, uh, you got a flight fare there and a flight fare home. That's what was, that was the cost. Everything else was on your own. You paid for everything else. Uh, I had to ride from the airport out to the, uh, uh, the Ciudad Universidad where they were going to hold the course. I got hit by a car right away. Smack out over the top, bango onto your back. And I had a mess, a real mess. So you lumber through that. We had about a week and a half for, before competition. In that uh, competition, Jack Disney was running 11 threes, 11 twos. He could cut 11 seconds. And at that age, at that era, in that period of time, and this was a quarter mile track at Mexico City. It's where they held and broke the records. He could do it. And there was only one other fellow, and that was a fellow by the name of, it was the Argentine sprinter. That I, Paolo uh, was his name, and, uh, his first name. Nice guy. Tony, a beautiful guy, just the nicest guy, but he knew what they had to do, and he was going to be a dominable sprinter, and you know, really tough. So we figured, well, we'll just go on the team. You did your little qualifying in amongst yourselves, and I rode the thousand, rode the first, I rode a 113, and just got through it, rode too low a gear. That you know what, you you have to self-criticize yourself. It was too thin of air, it should have gone a little higher, just put it all out. 113, the winning time was like a 196. So you knew the times were coming bad. One by an Argentine, or no, it was a Uruguayan won the time. Got to the 4,000. And 4,000, this was an effort to put four guys together and race against each other against the clock. The uh, interesting combinations were that the United States didn't have, they had four guys. We had, we had the numbers. The numbers looked pretty good. So our strategy was make sure you had to finish with three, make sure that Jack only rides six of the 12 laps and that he gets off and then we finish with the three. Well, we went all the way to third place on the time. So we looked like we could beat Mexico, really great. <laughs> we get to the final, we ride two laps and Al Stiller goes off the front, quit. He had an illness, he didn't tell anybody, but we didn't know. So he's riding, now we have Jack. We gotta let Jack go, to, we're done. We're toast. So Jack said, keep going. So we started pounding away. And we dragged Jack out in that race. He finished this, pushed him. We spun, did anything we could to get him out. We lost, but the Mexicans didn't catch us in 12 laps. And they should have been able to do that easily in three. So it was a grand effort. I felt this man really put out because he had to go and almost immediately start the sprints against competable, you know, very, very competition. He got through the first round, then he, the first thing they did, eliminate America, it was pretty good. Put the number one guy, who was second in the world at that point, 
up against Jack to eliminate. So this pattern began to disturb a lot of us who went home thinking, well, you know, it's not so good. It was kind of bad. We went into the road race. I got a flat. The other two finished, uh, but not just down in the field. Uh, road race was 120 miles or something like that. So um, you got an idea of, of that kind of competition. This was 1955. Come back and you have a good year. Uh, the rest of that's out. You move on into the next period, and you're coming up to an Olympic trials in 56. The option was then, what do you really want out of this sport? This is what you're asking yourself. What are you spending all your time doing this for? And the attitude was you better grab a little chunk of Europe or you're going to miss this activity for what it's really worth. That was the idea of the, of the cycling competitor. Consequently, uh, the, uh, made an effort to get to Europe. And uh, Reg Harris accepted us at his velodrome in Rush uh, Manchester, England. And we went over there and spent a month and a half racing with him. And it was a wonderful experience. It killed you. It really killed you. It just, it's the worst thing you could do. But you got to see what world professional cycling was about. You got to see the insides of a sport that is the beginning. It's a precursor of what is happening at the world level today. Because Reg Harris, a multi-world champion, was defending the money-making, which was at Grand Prix. It wasn't all the little inner circuit races they had occasionally, but it was at Grand Prix. At the Grand Prix, the money was made. That's when the, the corporations, which in this case was Raleigh Factory plus others, that were shelling out to, to uh, Harris how to ride. Now, this guy's a massive specimen. You heard, heard, saw him in 48. He and it was Bannister. It wasn't Bannister. It was another gentleman who rode on his tandem. They uh, survived with a flat tire, finished, and the Italians beat him. And he said, well, those Italians are so drugged. You couldn't believe it. Their eyes were popped out, and they never rode again. Point. Harris continues uh, riding this year, and we had to leave and went over to uh, Ubenhaven and rode the Worlds. And he shows up, and he lost all his form in 30 days. He was down, and Moss just beat him in the final. And Reg says, well, if you guys had stayed with him, I'd have won, because Moss couldn't beat him. He even was doped. Well, that's not that cast the aspersion on Antonio Maspis, but uh, the point was drugs were prevalent, but they were mostly in, and then I'll switch on to this for a second, they were mostly in the forms of coffee drinks, Coke, coffee. Uh, they uh, say to you, uh, there's a strychnine that they had worked out. They had all types of little tiny things worked out so that a person could take them as a pop-up, you know, boom, get right. Harris gave us a bunch of, tab uh, not tablets, uh, caffeine pills. They were just uh, raw coffee bean, just raw coffee bean. <laughs> and you say, well, I have a couple of those. Take a couple. Oh, that feels pretty good. But the thing was, it wasn't prevalent uh, to us. We just said, oh, who cares? It wasn't a big deal. Well, it's a big deal today. It's big money. And the criticisms of the French drug control can go on and on. I won't go on to that. We can ask questions if you like. Uh, the point was, you saw the beginning of it. You saw what was beginning to happen. You watched. Uh, the road racers, like Rick Van Steenberg and what have you, win the worlds that year. Uh, it is impressive to see a six foot two man carry a 53-14, and that's what he was sprinting with, which is pretty good. He just wiped everybody out. In this period, of course, the road bikes are coming on. You can see the end of the track bike. It's over. We're, we have our road bikes. We're riding them, but it's, it's almost over. The road bike is going to be in there. The track bike is going to be out. And for safety purposes, you ride a road bike today, <laughs> or a mountain bike, <laughs> to stay out of the way of a car. Um, and that fleshes out somewhat th what has happened. The return, uh, two years in the service, nothing. You return, and your club wants you to get ready for the final uh, effort, because they know you're, you're out of it, and you're older, and they don't need you around. So the... Uh, and you've only got five years to turn into road racing. <laughs> turn into a road racer has been riding track. So uh, the, the 60, now, the 60 uh, Olympic trials at Islip, New York, were an abomination. Horrible. That was the worst <coughs> venue that could have been imagined. 
And uh, the tragedy there was to see efforts of clubs just go to naught. The Army team had it down pretty well. Alan Bell had it down. They let Alan Bell ride around with no bags out there. And he could have ridden down below the pole line for all they knew. They never kind of looked at it. And when it was all over, the ABL says, well, we're going to finish this right here. You're going to ride this 4,000. We couldn't even hold the turns. You'd go up. You'd slide out from under you. This was an auto track, and it was a mess. The um, upshot was that they brought in the USOC. This is Mr. Brundage and all his cohorts brought in the chief counsel of the USOC to stop our protest about this track. And the final agreement from the, among the officials, the man, they, they didn't like us. And I'm driving a point here, and you'll pick it up real quick. You as a writer cannot get political. You get political, and they'll kill you. They will wipe you out. And they did wipe us out. Very simply. They just, I'll tell you in a minute how they do it. Um, the upshot was, of course, they demanded that the two rides go. Then they sent the whole group to Flushing Meadows. Flushing Meadows, it got sent on down to Belmar, then from Belmar back to Flushing Meadows. When the whole thing was over, they had a team. And California really got partially discriminated against, no question about it. They rigged it up. Without going into those details, uh, it's always a pleasure to be recognized as being beaten by a guy that makes the team. But to be slaughtered by nobodies, and you're fatigued and tired, and you did your best as you could, but you were political. You raised objections. You raised questions. That, you paid a penalty, and you were not going to be ever receive the, any kind of popularity with the ABL. But it was a start, because that led to more asking questions in the 60s, more asking questions that led up into the 70s, until finally the ABL fell. And it's rank amateurism. On Wednesday, Jack Disney told me in 1968, the, an official of the AA, pardon me, the ABL, and the USOC came to his business where he was working as an employee and asked if they were supporting him. That's the kind of internal crap that was going on. So that doesn't make for a very happy camper if you're a racer. You think, what is going on? You were lucky if you got 20 bucks from somebody. There was no money in this activity. And so what happened when Lamone <coughs> makes it, this is later, of course, when he makes it, he says, I'm not going to ride for peanuts. And you've watched the development of team sports since then in within this activity. If you can get the money, you can go ahead with it. We're all pro now, just professionals. That's it. And so all we could do is lay a groundwork for that to be happening today. So I think Mr. Armstrong owes us a few bucks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, uh, the, the accolades should go backwards a little bit on back on down the line. Uh, any questions? I went on to ride till 65. Uh, to Harry, I should apologize to Harry for not really properly introducing him. Um, in that narrative I wrote earlier, I mentioned some of his background. He was national junior champion in 50, and then I think at age only 17, he was on the Olympic team. Was that 18, 18. 18, excellent graduated team. From high school and went <laughs> graduated from high school, and the next day I flew on a DC-3. Hey, you're crazy getting in one of those planes, you know, two engine jobs like that. Flew one way, gambled. I looked out and I ran into John Butterfield in the first match. And Ted Ernst over here, my great buddy. <laughs> and obviously, Harry, <coughs> Harry is uh, clearly one of the uh, uh, the, the best sprinters in in, in the uh, in, in America. Well, I know it's a minute now. Um, also, Harry then took a break for a few years, I think, to, for education and military, and then uh, came back more as a road rider. Did the tour of St. Lawrence and the tour of Mexico about which there's a lot we can speak. I, I, I believe, oh, I'm just gonna make another comment about the, the trials there. I, I was there, not with any great anticipation, doing well. But the velodrome, the track that he's talking about in East High Slip, it was very much like the San Jose Speedway, except, except it wasn't even that, it was, it was just flat. 
And, and the reason riders protested is if you got up to any kind of speed at all, you'd hit your pedal on the track and you'd crash. That's why the protest. And I remember a number of riders literally sitting down on the track. They'd squat and fold their legs and said, we're not going to ride here. And it got pretty uppity. Uh, there was, uh, they were under threat of being arrested by the police. I mean, that's why this whole thing with Avery Brundage and why it was relocated to um, Flushing. Uh, Flushing is a huge parking lot. Um, with a, an oval painted on it, so one could race there. Let's see, I hope uh, folks will have a seat. Um, somebody reminded me of a, the meaning of uh, amateur and the meaning of professional in other than sports. Uh, sometimes the word amateur means uh, not very good, and sometimes the meaning of professional means the best. It's not always clear whether that's true in bicycle sport or not. Um, I would like the uh, next speaker to be Ted Kirkbride. Um, Ted's from San, uh, San Diego, and uh, Probably I'll let him tell us about him. All right, I got the first part done. I got the button pushed. Uh, actually, uh, when uh, Pete mentioned about the fact that many people uh, got into the sport and really didn't have aspirations to maybe be a professional or win a medal or, or uh, aspire to that, somehow in our, uh, in our little club, that actually somewhat was not the truth. It was the fact that you were there to aspire to, uh, you know, to the maximum greatness. Uh, or maybe as a young kid, I uh, envisioned that. But uh, how I got started in cycling is, uh, and, and it's kind of intertwined with, um, with other aspects that happened in my life. Uh, uh, a fellow uh, college student had gone and toured through Europe in uh, 19, about 1950 and uh, had gotten an English racer and it was uh, converted into a nine speed. And when he had come back uh, and we had just moved into a large area where all the World War II vets uh, had gotten housing, uh, probably was uh, very inexpensive to get the vets into houses at that time. And he was riding his bike by and uh, my uh, uh, longtime friend and juvenile delinquent in many aspects, uh, the guy rode by on his bike and uh, we uh, stopped him uh, uh, because it kind of looked funny and, and he showed us his bike and he made this chain jump from one sprocket to another and this was Houdini as far as I was concerned. That was incredible to see a chain jump from one sprocket to another and then he talked about how this gave him a extra low gear and he had these he called them rat trap pedals with mouse traps on it. You could put your feet in, so when you went up hills, you could pull up on the back stroke and push down. And and uh, and we lived on top of a of a steep hill. In fact, the hill was much uh, probably a design from San Francisco. It was like straight up. And whenever we would try to ride up the hill, we'd of course have to zigzag back and forth. And once I saw this, I had to have it because uh, it was just phenomenal. And so I had ordered this kit from a bike shop, uh, uh, and it came in and put it on the bike. Uh, to this day, I don't know really how I did it. Once I, years later, I f was showed how it was supposed to be done, and I have no idea how I did it, but somehow I made it work. And then my friend Phil had to have it for his three-speed racer also and now we could ride up this hill sitting down straight up it and that was like incredible and then we thought geez uh, we now can go to the beach uh, which was about 20 miles away 
rather than trying to take the bus going down in the middle of San Diego, transferring, going out, and taking half your day to get to the beach, we could ride our bikes out to the beach, and then we started thinking, wow, maybe we could go further, and the next thing you know, we were uh, going on bike hikes up to 80 miles a day, and the whole San Diego County opened up to us. We knew nothing about bike racing or anything else, but we had these bikes with turn down handlebars, nine speeds, and rat trap pedals with uh, uh, mouse traps. Uh, later on, we found out those weren't the real words, but that's what we were told they were called. And uh, on the beach, we were on our way to the beach, and there was four of us, and we had learned uh, as we rode that we would sit in, in formation because we found it was easier to ride together. We didn't know the aspects of sitting in, but it just became a natural process. The more we rode, we kind of just figured these things out. And as we went through a, a narrow uh, section of University Avenue, uh, about a mile past uh, uh, Zumwalt's bike store, but we didn't even know, we rode past Zumwalt's bike store all the time and never even knew it was there. But uh, uh, a door slightly opened on a car. Uh, my front wheel caught it and opened it all the way. The two, the two riders in front of me missed it, and I was shot off to the side sliding down the road, seeing great big car tires whizzing by me going the opposite direction. And my uh, uh, friend uh, Phil Criswell was right behind me, and the door now was wide open. And he hit the door head on, and it was a hard top convertible, so the glass window didn't have a metal frame. He hit it and slid across, crushed it down, and just shredded himself <clears throat> and tumbled down into the road. And the poor guy's car door was pretty much uh, folded totally forward. And uh, the police came, and we were, you know, a couple of young kids, and bleeding a little bit. Phil looked like he'd been through a potato peeler and so um, they uh, hauled uh, Phil off to uh, the doctors and the policeman said, because I wasn't really hurt, I just skinned up a little bit, but my front wheel uh, was bent back uh, uh, behind the bottom tube of my three-speed racer and he says, I'll, I'll take you to the bike store down the street here and uh, we'll um, uh, put your bike there because you can't ride it and maybe you can take the bus home or something. So we took it into the shop at Zoom Waltz and he brought it in and he looked at it and he wanted to know, well, who, who fixed your bike up? I had altered it quite a bit. I eliminated the cable housing because the cable would always stick to this thing and I put pulleys in and uh, eliminated all of that, drilled holes in the frame and put nails in it and riveted it and it was pretty, pretty half-assed but it worked. And uh, Zumo was wanting to know who did all the work on the bike, and I said, well, well, I did. And he says, you want a job? And uh, uh, previously, I'd been, uh, Phil and I had started up a lawn business, and we had uh, been mowing lawns and doing things like that to get money, because we could make a lot more money than delivering papers and didn't have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, and then Bob Zumo says, you know, uh, we have a, bike racing club that meets here on Monday nights. Uh, why don't you uh, come to this meeting? And uh, we thought, well, you know, we'd like to ride our bikes. We had no idea about bike racing. And uh, we uh, went, to the, went to, the, uh, to the club meeting, and this was uh, uh, late 1952. And he says, by the way, one of our uh, club members uh, was, uh, we have an Olympi Olympian on our club. And I knew about the Olympics, but had no idea bicycles had anything to do with the Olympics. Uh, I mean, I knew the famous Thorpe story about the Indian runner that got turned professional and, you know, all of that. I knew everything about uh, the sport of the Olympics, except cycling was not one of them. And so we went to the meeting, and, uh, of course, uh, we wore our typical Levi's and blue suede shoes, and uh, we we're, our two backgrounds were somewhat uh, from a, a pretty rough area uh, where there were, um, uh, if, I guess you, you could call it gangs, but they were really more large families or relatives. 
and you didn't screw with them. And so we, the two of us learned to be tough guys because if you weren't a tough guy, you got your butt beat. So even though you weren't a tough guy, you had to fake it. And we got pretty good at that, even though Phil was a tough guy. And uh, we went to the meeting, and then we were invited to go on the bike, uh, bike rides. We'd ride our bikes about 10 miles to Zumwalt store on Sunday morning, uh, get there, because now it was turning into winter. And uh, uh, we would go on the rides, and these guys would take off, and we'd never see them again. And they would always tell us, well, of course, the first thing we would do is we'd shove it in our highest gear because we had to stay up with them. And they'd say, no, 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 no. You know, you got to get in a low gear, get in a low gear, get in a low gear. You got to spin. And we're thinking, what, you know, we're in our jeans and our blue suede shoes trying to, uh, trying to keep up with them. But, it, but we thought, you know, those damn guys aren't going to leave us. And so we would uh, kill ourselves to stay with them most of the time. And then uh, Bob Zumwalt uh, with a fellow from uh, St. Louis named Alvin Newark had the nickname of Gooch. They said, you guys want to go to see a bike race? He said, uh, we're going to go up to Burbank and watch these guys uh, ride the uh, uh, Flying Saucer, which was on television. L Dick Lane was the announcer, which was very famous for roller derby. And they had uh, a Japanese uh, team had come over, uh, which they had talked about earlier, that was racing on the track, and uh, this guy, Harry Backer, was the only guy that was ever able to beat any of them on this track, from what I had understood, that he was uh, very competitive against these uh, guys. And so uh, we went up and watched this race, and it was almost as phenomenal as the chain shifting from one sprocket to the other. Here was this bank, and I think it was 58 degrees. The straightaway was probably 45 degrees. I don't know. I, I know that when you were in the center of the track, you had to get in the middle and start running to try to run up the, the, the straightaways. But there were guys on there uh, like, uh, what was it, the, the blonde flash or the platinum flash? That was Bob Tetzloff. That he had a name, they had Bones Baker, they had names for all these riders. But we saw this, we saw this uh, phenomenal thing with these guys staying up to a basically, a, looked like a straight wall, and the excitement, the speed, and the danger, it's like, we're hooked, that's what we want to do. We want to go out and kill ourselves. So. Uh, that was the first uh, track I ever rode was on that, and I only rode a little bit because eventually the track was uh, taken down very shortly, I think a year or so, or not much long after that, or it was moved, I don't remember. One year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so that was like, uh, wow. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Jerry Romoldi had a used Paramount, and, and we were trying to race on our English three speeds that probably weighed 40 pounds and had these great big worse than stone crusher tires. And he uh, uh, sold me this used Paramount for $35, but he wouldn't, I didn't have the money, so I could only give him like $5, $5 down. And he says, well, okay, he says, but I, I got to keep it at my house. When we go down to the track to race, you can come by and pick it up with me, and we'll ride to the track, or we'll ride down to the Balboa Park, and we do the sprint training, and uh, then you bring it back until it's paid for. And I eventually got it. I got it paid for. So now I had a bike with sew-up tires, and uh, that was my first racing bike. And most everybody was riding uh, track bikes on the road. Uh, there was a, a, a little bit of, uh, of derailleur bikes uh, uh, that were, uh, were around. There was a very few Paramount road bikes, but there, it was mainly the Automoto uh, was the big thing that uh, Zumwalt's had, and I think Ed Lynch imported those. Uh, and there was a four-speed Automoto with the wing nuts, and it was probably a purplish color. Uh, and uh, it had uh, pretty good sized stone crushers on it. I think they were uh, Hutchison tires, probably 48 ounce. I remember riding them for over a year and the tread eventually wore down. It looked like a racing slick. 
there was so much tread on it, but I never got a flat. But uh, we, uh, we rode the track bikes on the road, and really there weren't, once you went east out of San Diego, the roads were pretty clear, the cars didn't really go that fast, the trucks were great because you had the, the, big, the big cement trucks with the chain drive on the rear wheel. Those things going up the hills, you had no trouble staying with them. And then once you got over the hill, they only went like 40 or so miles an hour on the level. So you could sit in on them. So the big thing was sitting on the cement trucks or the big hay trucks coming out of the valley. You could catch the hay trucks and... Uh, uh, coming out of El Cajon, you could catch them going up the hill, and then there was a long down and straight hill. And I think Harry Backer had some type of a difficulty once, uh, <laughs> running into the back end of one or something, as I, somebody was telling me, and went sliding down the road. But anyways, we, we could stay up with the cars on our track bikes, and you'd go to J.C. Penney's, and you'd buy a nice big heavy set of leather gloves and cut the fingers off. And when you had to really stop fast, you'd stick your hand you know, behind your handlebar and glove the front tire while you backpedal to try to stop, and hopefully you didn't burn all the way through the glove before you uh, ended up on the ground. And uh, I finally got to uh, ride my first uh, uh, club uh, sprint race, and we, we used to do uh, uh, an intense uh, workout, uh, and then there would be these long sprints, and you would, we'd ride around about a mile course, and then we would ride down a sprint and they used to have, so we'd start out in the winter three and three, you'd have three sprints, take a rest, three more sprints, and we worked up to what's called five and five. And I finally got uh, to where uh, they let me ride in the big races and there were a couple of guys from the Midwest and the East, a guy named Butterfield, uh, uh, a guy named um, uh, Ray Renick, and then there was a guy named Alan Bell and his legs had this black hair on it. I mean, it looked like a gorilla. And we'd say, you know, you should shave your legs. And he says, you wanna know something, buddy? He says, I'm out there on that aircraft carrier. I go back on that aircraft carrier with shaved legs. He says, I'd, be, I'd have some problems. <laughs> and so the first, the very first sprint race I rode, we were hauling down there and I didn't really know really quite what to do but I was trying to stay on, and we had this one big guy, Paul Tenney, and he would go from the front, and he would just go like mad, and I was gonna hang on somebody's wheel, and somebody wanted the wheel I was on, and I didn't understand the game. I thought if you were on a wheel, it was yours. The next thing I know, I remember sliding down the road at about 40 miles an hour, uh, and I only weighed about 120 pounds at the time, and I was being skinned from head to toe, side to side, because somebody wanted that wheel, and they just took it and left me on the ground. Well, uh, that, was, uh, that was quite an experience. So I had seen the track racing on this uh, flying saucer. I saw some uh, races out in Palm Springs where this uh, platinum flash would sprint away from everybody on this big circle. We had some races down in the Balboa Park where they'd had the uh, races and uh, this guy, uh, this platinum flash broke his pedal off hitting, if I remember right, the railing or, or hit something. But uh, uh, this guy Tetzloff was quite a sprinter. Didn't know much about him as a road rider uh, so much as that he was the guy that could, could sprint. And of course, I had to then also have the fact that you had riders like Harry Backer and of course, Jack Disney, Bob Tetzloff in, in our circle besides other very good riders. And then you had the Northern California contingent and Northern California and Southern California were like two different worlds. It just seemed like it was two different worlds. But in Southern California, we had real road races. We had mountains that you would climb two and three miles, maybe five or six miles, seven miles. Uh, and so you did have to have road bikes. And uh, road bikes started to, to really surface uh, in about 1954, 55 in our era. Now they probably were there before that, 
uh, because Bergino was bringing in some of the top Italian bikes at the time, and I'm sure Tetzloff had the best at that time. Uh, we had a fellow in San Diego brought in the French Le Pearl, the type that uh, Jean Cotel originally started to ride. We had Ed Lynch, I think Ed Lynch brought in the Automotos as well as the uh, Folus. The Folus still had the simplex derailleur on it, but a, a top quality one. And uh, Jack Kemp brought in the Swiss uh, Allegros. And it was very evident when I first started riding why no one rode a road bike is because we had these simplex telescoping derailleurs that really you, if you were sitting on somebody, you had to worry that it wasn't going to explode and shrapnel would be all over you. <laughs> so the road bike was, the derailleur systems were, were really not too, uh, not too reliable, but when that Campagnola parallelogram derailleur came on, problems were solved. You had definite positive shifting that wasn't going to go awry unless you fell down and bent it. So the road racing uh, in Southern California was uh, uh, real road racing. We had a 90 mile race back in I think 54 Bob Tetzloff won that one. That was, uh, I think it was 54, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 54, but Jerry Romoldi promoted it. It started in a town out near Lakeside, went out up over what's called Muzzy Grade, which is a really a tough grade, dropped down into Poway, uh, went on, had about a seven mile climb up into Ramona, then back through Undulating, and then back down and finished in, uh, in the park. And uh, going up the hill, uh, Jerry Romoli and I had set the pace, and the next thing we knew towards the top, there was Tetzloff, uh, Phil Criswell, Bob Zumwalt Jr., uh, oh, uh, Coxley, Coxley was still there. There was a, a small group of us that had gotten away, and, and on the downhill, we were really going fast down the hill, and uh, I remember I was not a very good downhiller, and, and I could see Tetzloff over to the side, and, and I was trying to emulate the way he was tucking in, and so I wouldn't get blown off on the downhill, and then all of a sudden I heard a bam, and I thought, oh, Tetzloff flatted, great, and all of a sudden my tires are going thump, 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 thump. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Bob. Uh, uh, I got a quick change on the rear wheel, Unfortunately, I had only a four-speed sprocket on the back, and they put on a five-speed rear wheel. And uh, then, then the bunch caught us, and as we dropped into, the, into Poway, and by the way, this, this road race is being uh, filmed for television. There was this little sports car in the front, and there was a fellow uh, that lived not too far. He was a neighbor of uh, Dick Cox's, if I remember right. But they had the sports, fancy sports car with the big camera on it. But anyways, we dropped down into Pow this Poway area and all of a sudden there was a big crash and, and Harry Backer goes flying through the air and lands on his head and uh, uh, was that down and out. And uh, I began to chase with the rest of the group and of course the riders that uh, I was originally with, they stayed away and uh, uh, myself and a couple other riders, we got away on the big hill and. I think I finished seventh or eighth, but Bob Tetzloff won it, and I think Bobby Zumwalt Jr. was second. Yeah, you won it. No, you won it. Yeah, I got a picture of you with the big, <laughs> the big B A R. But uh, anyways, uh, uh, afterwards uh, there was this program called Harold King in the News. He was uh, always had big things on. I think it was Channel Eight and. Uh, Harry and Bob Zumwalt, uh, they were all interviewed on television and the, the uh, race was shown. So it was, it was kind of interesting because at that time at television they were hurting to have something on. Uh, again, the, we had the bike races on television in the Flying Saucer and it was very, very colorful. And also at that time we raced in Mexico a lot. I rode more races in Mexico than I did in Los Angeles in those first few years. And the races down there were uh, probably more European than anything uh, because there were large crowds, rough roads, different terrains. 
so it was kind of exciting. Um, uh, even Bob, I remember, rode one of the races down there where we had a circuit, and of course he won that. He would win a lot. Uh, uh, and uh, but in the races in in uh, Southern California, we did a lot of handicap races. That was my first, uh, the first trophy I ever won uh, was uh, a handicap race, Santa Susana. And uh, they had uh, three, there was not a such thing as junior and senior. There was category A, category B, and category C. And it made no difference what your age, you were in one of those categories. And uh, I started out, of course, in that race as category C and I got uh, probably like a five minute start, then the B's another five minute, and then the A's had to chase. And we went up over the Santa Susana Mountain, and of course uh, I, I had some type of natural ability to uh, go up hills without any trouble. And I stayed away, and a couple of B riders caught me, and uh, we came back to the final, uh, the final hill, and I went up the hill with these other two riders, but on the downhill, they just zipped away. I just couldn't go downhill. And one of them was, I think his last name was Jones. He, was, he used to ride a motorcycle a lot. Uh, but he, they flew down this hill. I had to chase them. So I got first in my class and third overall. And I thought, wow, that's really great. I'm going to, you know, I, I, it was great. Uh, so handicap races on the road became a a real builder of, you had to, when, when they said go, you had to go. Because in a handicap race, there was no sitting in. If you sat in, you were going to be caught. So it was very intense, those, those races. And over time, uh, it, it, I think it was a real uh, good development part uh, of the sport. And my first real head-to-head -head race with Bob Tetzloff was at the Seminautica, uh, and I think that was 1955 or so, uh, but they had three races. Uh, they had a, a, a large circuit race. Then I think they had, uh, was it a sprint? And then there was this uh, hill climb, and I can't remember the name of the r road, but the road was such that cars almost had to back up to turn to get around the switchbacks. And so I just went in the race, and I just started riding up the hill like I normally did, tried to go as fast as I could, and got about halfway up the hill and I kind of looked around and, and here was this guy behind me and, and Bob's style was, was Bob's style. You never knew whether he was dying or that's just the way he was riding, but he worked his bike. He worked his bike. And we got up towards the top and I, I wasn't sure what to do. Uh, you know, I could see the finish line. Well, Bob knew what to do, you just go like hell. Uh, whether, no matter how tired you were, and he made me uh, go backwards, uh, but I uh, had some experience uh, finally at least getting, uh, getting someplace in the race. So that was uh, c what bike racing was. That's how I got started in bike racing, uh, was uh, running into a car door. Uh, so it was quite a launch. Uh, as the, as the, uh, the aspect here about Dr. Graves is that uh, the bike club was a, uh, the San Diego Bike Club was a, a, an interesting group because the club really rode, for the most part, not all the riders, but the, the club's idea was, was to ride as a team. Otherwise, you, you basically would, if you were in a race, you would do what you could do for your team rider. And it was a philosophy that, um, uh, made many races more difficult for uh, other riders because we would actually sacrifice one another to some extent uh, to, uh, uh, to help another rider or we wouldn't chase down our own riders. And that was kind of ingrained on us that there was this um, uh, code, of, code of ethics uh, as, a, as a rider. And the, the first uh, major race that uh, uh, I rode uh, against Bob Tetzloff was I think it was a dry, Latigo, was one of the Latigo races. We, we started in Topanga, went up over the Topanga Mountains down to the coast. I think we went up to Latigo, but we finished in Calabasas. And uh, on the last uh, big hill, 
uh, Tetzloff takes off up the hill, uh, and there was probably only maybe a half a dozen of us left at that point. And, um, and, and I think in that group, there was a couple of riders that were fairly good sprinters, uh, as far as sprinters, not road sprinters. And so Bob decided to dispense with everybody at that time, and my teammate Phil Criswell went with him up the hill, and uh, there was another rider that was really good in the mountains. Um, oh, his name escapes me right now. Very th M Ralph Martin. He could turn a gear over. He, he uh, and he could go up hills. Is that right? Yeah, I think uh, I know that he was. He had quite an interesting World War II uh, uh, experience. But anyways, we uh, uh, as they went up the hill, I figured I would let them get as far uh, up the hill as was comfortable, and then I closed the gap very quickly and caught him right at the top. Now, that left two little juvenile delinquent uh, thugs and Bob Tetzloff, and I knew, number one, Phil Criswell could beat me with one leg and one arm, and uh, so I knew I couldn't beat him, and it was forget about even thinking about trying to beat Bob Tetzloff. So my, my point was I was go, okay, I'm gonna use the tactic that I'm gonna take off and go and either Bob Tetzloff's gonna let me go because Phil was a formidable sprinter. Finished second to Jack Disney in I think the 59 uh, national championships. But uh, Phil was a, was a good formidable sprinter. I was uh, not a, a, a road sprinter at all. So I took off as hard as I could, and Bob had a choice. Let me go and win the race or chase me down with Phil sitting on his wheel. And so Bob chased me down, and as soon as he caught me, I took off again, and Bob had to chase me again. Well, by the time the finish line came up, Tesloff had probably rode five or six sprints, and Phil Criswell's sitting back there eating ice cream sitting on his wheel. <laughs> And when the finish line came, I made another big effort, and Bob had to chase me, but uh, Phil was able to nip him at the line. So we finally dethroned the king, and uh, you know we were we were really happy. Uh, Bob wasn't happy uh, because he was teamed big time. But these were the things that we were taught uh, from our club: how you had to ride. You had to ride with tactics, and. Uh, so the, the, this, the, the racing in Southern California was the real road racing. You had to have road bikes, and you had all of a sudden these great road bikes. The, I bought a, my automoto, my four-speed automoto with the wing nuts. Uh, was okay because I could get, usually get three gears out of the four, and if you changed the wrong wheel, you couldn't get any. But I got this LaPearl. Campagnola derailleur, uh, center pole brake, aluminum cranks. Can you believe it? it had aluminum cranks, not the pinned on steel ones that got loose or got crooked. And, uh, and the bike only weighed like 21 pounds and was just, it was a marvelous 10 speed uh, machine. And it made the, the road racing a lot easier. Earlier in, in the, to regress into the beginning of, the, of going to the bike club meetings, uh, Dr. Graves uh, was a uh, frontline surgeon in the Second World War. And he was, if I remember, he's from Holland. Uh, and he uh, played a honky tonk piano in the bars in order to put him through medical school. During the Battle of the Bulge, he got trapped behind German lines. He uh, evidently had, you know, the scruffy clothes and such they were probably wearing, uh, being in the uh, surgeon, being the frontline surgeon. He jumped on his bike, played like a peasant, rode through the German lines to get back to the U.S. side, and uh, uh, was able to pull it off. Of course, he spoke he spoke German and Dutch and. You know, so he, he, he pulled it off, and he told me the story that uh, as he uh, got off the sh troop ship carrying his bike over his shoulder, somebody yelled out, uh, hey, buddy, you going to get your job at the Western Union when you get back? And uh, 
he uh, he settled in La Jolla and was a uh, was an avid cyclist, obviously from uh, from the get go, probably from his homeland, and he wanted to. Uh, start this touring club and he uh, as, as I remember it Harry Backer brought a message to the club and said that uh, this uh, Dr. Graves would like to have some of our because the San Diego Bike Club was larger at that time than the at, uh, eventually became the AYH if you would go on the bike rides in order to give them more bodies so that so the would ride and so uh, I would would ride out to La Jolla Junction which was probably a 35 mile ride to go and ride with them and uh, uh, got to know Dr. Graves and uh, it was kind of funny on the first ride uh, we had been taught how to sit in and such and we, we used to call it hooking a wheel. If somebody had come by you'd hook somebody's wheel and get on it. <coughs> so I said to him, I said, uh, Doctor, uh, why don't you guys hook a wheel? Because they were riding all over the road and he says, oh, he says, that'll break the spokes out of your wheel. He thought I meant hook into their wing nuts, you know. And so uh, I had to ponder that for a while. But I, I rode with them, and, and eventually the uh, touring club got larger and larger and then started doing multi-day rides. And so the winter, many of, uh, many of the riders, many of us riders, would actually during the winter go on his multi-day rides, three- and four-day rides, and camp out for winter training. Uh, and Dr. Graves was also very in tune with the sport of bike racing. He spoke the language, he had the magazines that he would get the European magazines in, and he would talk about uh, the racing. He helped riders, I think he helped Harry and Rudy Cecina go to Europe. Uh, uh, he, ha he helped him a, a, a little bit, uh, gave him some loans to go to Europe and race. If I, isn't that right? Was yeah. Pardon? There was a sea, ca uh, sea captain in the community that was walking it at the time. I'm s his name slips me right this minute, but he supported Rudy over there. Uh, Dr. Graves uh, offered me $1,000 to go. I asked him if he could uh, front $1,000, which was the flight, and that was it, 1000 And uh, when I got out of the service, I repaid him. Yeah, but so Dr. Graves was quite, a, uh, quite an enthusiast. He, he kind of uh, uh, liked us uh, bike racers, except that we were a little, a little rowdier than most of his touring group. Uh, we would uh, maybe... Uh, get somebody in their mummy bag and roll them down a hill while they were camping and such. But, but he kind of enjoyed it, but uh, uh, he, would, he would help uh, uh, and kind of, uh, I remember I had uh, one time I'd, I'd had an injury and he, uh, Jerry Ramoldi said, you better go check that out. And Dr. Graves took care of me, no, no charge. And, and he, he kind of helped a little bit. And, and then the, the, there, there was some conversation about the amount of drugs that were being used, uh, uh, which was part of part of sport, not just cycling. It was part of sport. Uh, but uh, he uh, he knew a great deal about what was happening, and he basically said, "Here's here's what you get, and here's what ta is taken from you," and from his. Uh, conversations and one of his cute little uh, aspects he said he says well he says Ted he says you can take a plow horse and you can give them drugs but you're not going to make them a thoroughbred he says however the plow horse is going to go a hell of a lot faster he says but you've got to pay he says you're going to pay so if you get this you're going to have to give this and at that point, I thought, uh, because my aspirations, even at that uh, young age, was uh, I, I wanted to be like Fausto Kofi. I wanted to win bike races by myself. Fausto Kofi won probably more bicycle races by more minutes than probably any cyclist since. But he was my hero, and he won races because he could go up hills. I couldn't sprint, so I knew I had to win bike races by by myself, which I was never successful at. But uh, that was my aspirations. 
So my point was that it, mentally I said, okay, if I was really going to be good, I'm going to have to be good and either be a thoroughbred and not a fast plow horse. So I uh, uh, chose that uh, uh, that wasn't going to be part of my, uh, of my career. And it was kind of strange because one of the heroes was, the, of course, the Rhodes brothers. And Dave Rhodes was uh, considered one of the purest cyclists. That was what was conveyed to me and when I met him and what little time I ever talked to him. He was a pure athlete. And I don't think, I think he was, his ability was going to be his ability. And, and that always impressed me. Uh, his brother Ronnie was a little more wild, if I remember right. And, uh, and as I recall, I thought Ronnie Rhodes turned professional somehow uh, because, but I, I remember that because I remember there was a big thing. We were at a race and he said, oh, there's this professional riding, but nobody's supposed to say. And I don't know whether that was Ronnie Rhodes or some, uh, somebody else. And this was in the, the early, uh, you know, probably in the 54, 55 era. But uh, I, I remember, and I'm thinking, professional, wow, that would be great. I'd like to see a professional bike racer because uh, all we knew that it was, they were something special. So Dr. Graves was, a, um, uh, was quite, a, quite an inspiration, and he um, uh, started having, uh, taking riders to uh, Europe and, tra and have bikes made by Rennie Ayers. And uh, I had, later on, I had Rennie Ayers make me my, my personal bikes for me uh, when I started racing again. The, uh, so th that was my experience in getting started, the type of racing that was going on in Southern California. Uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Graves, and, and he, he supported, uh, supported us in, uh, in information and, and in some health issues. Uh, and the, uh, the point about the 1956 Olympic uh, road race selection, uh, after the, uh, the trials we had in Southern California, uh, Bob Tetzlaw, Phil Crystal, and I kind of made a pact together because most of the races in Southern California, there was the three of us usually finished in the, and everybody else was some, usually West Chowan was soloing behind us. The West Chowan was the greatest time trialer because he had a lot of practice <laughs> chasing us. But, uh, uh, and I, I, was, I was the most consistent of the three. I got third every time. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, we kind of made a pact that we were gonna train together and uh, Bob Best uh, ended up and we all, Bob Best, Phil and I lived in Bob Tetzloff's house because Bob's parents were, I think, they were uh, super musicians and they were, I think, touring. So we took over the Tetzloff house and we trained and trained and trained. I mean, we were training for the Tour de France. We, we were really, really training, much more than probably we should have uh, before we moved up to my aunt and uncle's in Santa Cruz, there was one race in uh, Lake Sherwood. And the uh, top uh, army teams, Dodd and all the guys were there. And that was, a real, that was a real road course. And we rode it, and as it went along, I had a little bit of a bad luck uh, at that time uh, the hubs were, uh, at least the, the ones I had, were steel shells with aluminum flanges pressed on. And on the, uh, one of the hills on the next to last lap, as I was going up the hill, something went funny on my front wheel and the uh, aluminum flange broke. And my front wheel was wobbly and so I was out. But subsequently, Bob Tetzloff eliminated each of the riders one at a time so there would not be two of them to chase him all the way around until he got rid of the last rider and won the race. I learned a lesson later on. I won the Berkeley Hills using that tactic. Uh, and uh, we then went up to Santa Cruz. Uh, we trained. We went up over the mountains. We went everywhere. We were uh, uh, 
we were tearing up the roads, we thought, or we were, but uh, not knowing that we probably should have been down in Pasadena sprint training, uh, not road riding, because the course in San Francisco was one nice steep hill, which was a good hill, it was a good part of the race, a little bit of a level spot, and then it was basically downhill all the way around, finish line to the bottom of the hill and up again. And uh, 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 myself and another rider named Lund, is it Bill or Bo Bill Lund from uh, Oregon? Seattle. He was a really good hill climber too. The two of us would get away and we'd be gone. And we'd be out there pounding our brains out and here would be about a 40 man field just swooping down these hills and it was just impossible. I spent more time when I was in the field, I spent more time with my hands on the brakes than my foot on the pedal. So the course was not Olympic standard. And when the sprint came, there was a, I can't remember the young boys, he was 14 years old. He stayed in the field to the finish line. That's how hard the course was. Was he 13? It was so discouraging because here we had spent all this time training for a road race and we were riding a sprint race. And when the sprint came down, uh, you know, I, I had given up uh, long before it started going fast because my mental position was there's no way in hell I was gonna do anything here. Phil Criswell finished fifth. In fact, he fil finished fifth both days. Yeah. And, pardon? Yeah, there was three to qualify the first day. And it was an interesting sprint because uh, if you knew how to ride that course, the best place to be was off to the side to the left because <coughs> the wind come across. And the whole field, just like a door, it swung like this. So if you were back in the back on the side, you won. If you tried to ride it down the straight road, you got hit by the wind. I remember following that a little bit. Oh, I don't know anything about that. I don't recall anything like that. The second day was a different story. It was a little harder. But it was not, it was a course that you could not really, if the top riders would have gone to the front, it would have probably been a 10 or 15 person at the most finish. But 40 riders on a downhill versus two or three is an impossibility. That you just, you can coast so much faster in a group. Second day was a lot harder, I luckily punctured uh, with a couple of with a couple of laps to go, so uh, but it was it was very discouraging, and actually that uh, that race was so discouraging that I basically dropped out of the sport mentally. Uh, I started to ride a little bit, uh, but um, I uh, decided to get a uh, while I was going to school. I decided to get a shop, get a job in a uh, machine shop making uh, jet engine parts. Uh, uh, for income while I was going to school. Well, yeah, when, well, yeah, uh, so the next thing I know, I, and I was a uh, mathematics, uh, <coughs> physics major, and I have no idea, I was, evidently there was some genetics that made that uh, very easy for me. So I excelled in uh, in physics and mathematics and wanted to go on and become an engineer. I went to school and I hated school. And so you, everybody had, at that time, everybody had a military obligation coming up. And actually it was a six year obligation. You had to spend at least two years in the military uh, or I think they had a six months and you could uh, then have seven and a half years in the reserves or you could put in four years, there'd be no reserve. There was all kinds of things, but I, I, I signed a contract with the, uh, actually it was the Treasury Department at the time and it was, uh, the Coast Guard was under the Treasury Department. And some friends of mine says, that's, uh, when I was going to, started to college, said, that's what you want to get into, that these guys, they do all kinds of exciting things 
yeah, that was a BS. But uh, anyways, uh, so I joined uh, the reserve when I turned 18, uh, which was just shortly after the Olympic trials, and uh, was going to college, working in a machine shop. Uh, uh, I didn't ride very much at all in uh, 1958. I just rode a little bit, and it was uh, it was no, it just wasn't there. And so uh, school was a kind of a pain, and uh, I got tired of going out and getting drunk all the time with the college guys and such, even though it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I dropped out of school and went ahead and uh, decided to take my obligation. But I was able to be sent, I was able to go to school, uh, to an electronic school, and uh, spent my time in the service. And Phil Criswell got a hold of me. Uh, we still stayed friends because we'd go out and raise cane whenever I'd get home. And he says, "Hey, I want to, I want to uh, make a four-man, four-thousand-meter team." He says, "Could you start riding again?" He says, "Harry's out of the. I think Harry was just out of the army." Uh, and he said, uh, "Let's start this and see what we could do," because we had we had ridden. Uh, you know, as a team, our club has ridden as a team. And in fact, I reminded Harry that uh, in, uh, I think it was 55 or 56, there was a four-man road race. It was a four-man team uh, time trial. Uh, and uh, we showed up at it, and our team was the only one on track bikes because it was a f level course. So we were still, track bikes still weren't totally out on the road. And uh, we eventually won that uh, uh, road uh, uh, team race uh, on our track bikes. And, uh, uh, but that's a, a side note. So I said, well, yeah, I said, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to do that. And uh, I got a letter from uh, the, uh, I think, uh, someone sent a letter from the ABL to the, uh, 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 department that uh, uh, to allow me to have time to train and I had been on a search and rescue uh, uh, and, a, and a patrol gunboat that was during the actually the during the Vietnam buildup which wasn't supposed to have started until later in the 60s but it was actually happening in the late 50s uh, and we were out uh, doing search and rescue uh, uh, for any uh, pilots uh, uh, going in and out of Vietnam, and uh, then also as a radio beacon. So I got off of that uh, and got stationed down in San Diego and was in charge of the electronic repair shop on Ballast Point in Point Loma and was given time to train. And at that time, we could, we could come up, it was Harry, Phil, and myself, but none of the other riders in our club could really cut the speed, and so Phil said, look at Dave Sharp's really good, and he would fit in really great. And so Dave Sharp came down, and we started uh, training. We had uh, motor pacing. We had a, quite, a, quite a regiment uh, to, uh, for training, and we had a course uh, uh, that was a uh, four, it was perfectly measured out 4,000 meter, but it was flat. It wasn't a track, because there was no tracks around at the time. And uh, we, worked, uh, we worked our times down. And again, this wasn't on a velodrome, but it was on basically an out and back course uh, that had like uh, circular turns. But we were riding within uh, eight to 10 seconds of world uh, record times. And you can do that faster than you can do it on a track. On a straight road like that, you can actually ride faster than you can on a track. But we were, we were moving. And then the Olympic trials uh, in 1960, which I want to touch a little bit about, we met uh, the president of the ABL, which was uh, Mr. Thorpe. And uh, he said, look at they're not going to, because Ed Lynch was out there at Islip and showed to them that that track was nowhere close to the track in San Jose. This track was a joke, was, should never be ridden. And, Thorpe said, hey, 
because we saw them at the airport. He said, they're, they're not, the races aren't going to be held at Islip. Uh, it's not going to happen. He says, uh, they're going to be out at Belmar where the 52 Olympic trials are going to be. So we, Jack Disney, Harry, Phil, myself, we paid for the rental car for Thorpe to take us out to Islip. That it wasn't well. Maybe he maybe he was in charge of the Thorpe was in charge of something. Well, he was more the president. Okay, but then he was Olympic he was in Olympic yeah maybe he was in charge of Olympic committee. Uh -huh. So they drove us out to uh, out to Belmar and we started training and we used Jack Disney as our fourth rider as we were training and of course Jack was incredibly fast and strong and uh, one evening we get a call and says hey guys uh, by the way. Uh, the races aren't going to be at Belmar. They're going to be at Islip tomorrow. And uh, a, I think it was, was it Moen? Uh, somebody had a car. Yeah, and we all piled in this car to drive that day to Long Island to ride the Olympic trials. And in the meantime, Harry was on the phone. Harry was our politician. <laughs> and uh, the agreement was with the uh, Chicago group is that we were going to protest the track and nobody would ride. So <laughs> we agreed to that. So we left basically our racing equipment and took our bikes with some training gear on it just so we could show up. Uh, on the way out there, we were at a stop sign and all of a sudden Jack screams out, door flew open and he's running around jumping around with a big cramp in his leg and <laughs> we got back and we finally got to Islip and the politics were flying all over the place and the statement came from the uh, uh, that, that we were going to race on it and we met with Jack uh, a number of us went up and met and I don't know whether you were there or not met with the a, B, the representatives at their hotel room in New York and Jack knocked on the door and they weren't going to let us in because they thought that we were going to throw them out the window. Actually, we were thinking that, I think. But anyway, we went in and we said, look, this is, this is terrible. And they said, look, we gonna, we're going to have these races on this track because we got a $225 deposit. And Jack said, hey, I'll give you the $225. And they said, no, you're going to race. And when this, this, it was a big brouhaha, and basically the downside was whoever rides this race is going to make the Olympic team, and we don't care if it's a bunch of paper boys, in essence, is what was said. And uh, the first couple of races were, were ridden. Uh, we rode the 4,000 meter uh, against the uh, Chicago team, which agreed to show up and be part of the protest. and. Berlando had made special lifts on the backs of their bikes to ra raise their bottom brackets off their, I mean, yeah. Okay. All right, real good. But anyways, that, that was, uh, we could go on on that, but it, uh, to give you an idea, I think Eddie Rudolph fell down in the kilometer he got going so fast. Uh, that's how dangerous the track was. And uh, I won't get into the, into the velodromes uh, or, or anything else. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. All right, yeah.